the name Atticus Finch, just from your heart, what does that name stand for to you? You know, when I was trying these cases over the, over the years, I never thought really of Atticus Finch or To Kill a Mockingbird. You would like to, the story would be better if I said, you know, and every time I went in the courtroom, I thought Atticus Finch would do this because he was seeking truth and he did this praise. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I, I read the book as a freshman. I think, I think subconsciously mm -hmm. that stayed with me to know that there are people who are wrongfully accused mm -hmm. and how terrible that is mm -hmm. and to do everything we can and that there is racial prejudice mm -hmm. and we should eliminate that at, at, at every opportunity and particularly strip it away in a courtroom. And so, uh, it's an inspiration and maybe an inspiration in a way that I really didn't realize at the time until afterwards people uh, approached me about it and said, hey, that's, you know, w w would you do a seminar about Atticus Finch because you've won some cases, people wrongfully accused of color, which, which is to kill a mockingbird. Mm -hmm. uh, now going back and rereading it uh, w from the perspective of having pretty much been there on several occasions, really opened it up more for me and made me appreciate more of not only how well written that book was and how timely that book was when it came out around 1960 when I was in the first grade and six years later going to integration and how that influenced, you would hope, have an influence on society. But at the same time, gave you hope that, again, that people looked at people as just another human being on an equal basis mm -hmm. with yourself. Well said. Tattersville uh, is a very interesting place. It, it, has, uh, it has very good people. And again, there are a lot of disagreements mm -hmm. that we may have politically and things of that nature, but deep down I found them to be very good people who will do anything for you. You could not be so fortunate if your house uh, burns down or you run a problem than to be in Alexander County because you will be flooded with people wanting to help. Great. And it's the old... We're rebuilding the barn uh, back in the, in the West in colonial times mm -hmm. where everybody came together and did. That's pretty much the case here in this county. If, if something, if you have a problem and you're, you're wanting some help, the people here will flood you with help. Can't say more about a place than that. No, that's, that's, that's why I've been here all my life. I'm on my way to visit a good friend, Joel Harbinson. Joel is an attorney over in Alexander County, North Carolina, in Taylorsville, North Carolina. It's in the western part of the state, uh, snug, snuggled up under the foothills there. A very conservative area of the, uh, of the state. Uh, went overwhelmingly for President Trump this past election. Overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, Joel's a Democrat. Uh, Joel's not a Republican, but I'll tell you what, that Joel this is Joel's town. Joel does tremendous work for the good people of Taylorsville, of Alexander County. I guess along with everyone, has represented three Hispanic individuals, each charged with very serious sexual offenses, back to back to back, and all three were uh, acquitted. None were found guilty of those uh, offenses. Joel's going to show us around his office today, show us some of the memorabilia he has collected, share some history of Alexander County and Taylorsville, and he's also going to talk about trial technique with us. So enjoy our visit today, enjoy my visit with Joel Harbinson, attorney at law over in Taylorsville, North Carolina. Okay, Wes, you ready to roll? Oh, man, I am ready to roll. Welcome, welcome to my office. <laughs> this is an office that has been many things, and, and I'll tell you as we go through. Okay. Over the last century. Mm -hmm. But I got it around the mid 90s and renovated it. So I'll go through and show you a little bit. Great. Can't wait. These bars will have more meaning when we get to the back of my office because at one time 
the back of my office, my conference room now was the local drunk tank. And these <laughs> are the actual bars out of that drunk tank. Wow. And we'll, I'll show you how that was as we get through it. So I, oh. I certainly had to preserve them. Uh, <laughs> It's not every day you buy an office for a lawyer that has bars in it. <laughs> you know, you pass the bar, you don't pass the bars every time you come in my office. <laughs> so, no doubt about it, Joe. So come on in. So when I when I did renovate it, this was not here. The last thing it was oh was goodness. a uh, site for a construction firm. So when I did it, I liked the high ceilings and I, and I wanted to have a walkway like that, which I thought was sort of a small town Southern tradition. And it you know, yes. has all the books that I no longer use that when I started practicing 40 years ago, I used religiously. Mm -hmm. Now for $39 a month, I can get internet uh, legal research, but they look good. They look great. So, <laughs> it looks like a, a small town office and that's what it, that's what it was at some point. It sure does. And you first started here, and I'm going, when did you first start? I started practicing, practicing in 1979. Okay. I, I moved to this office in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. I think 1994, actually. Now, 100 years ago, this office was a silent movie theater. And the evidence yes. of that is yes. over here, where you'll see the front of it. This is my office, the front of my office, exactly in 1920, when it had Rudolph Valentino the Sheik. Wow. My mother was born here in Townsville in, in 1916. This opened in, in uh, 1920. This has some references to a book, Big Time for a Dime, by Donald Barker that has the history of Western North Carolina theaters which is really odd, but that's the front of my office. It's a silent movie theater. So what we're going to do in the next couple of years to commemorate this is that the Rotary Club is building an amphitheater here in the middle of town. Yes. So I told them that we would like to provide uh, silent movies oh. with donations, free the public, but donations go going to the mobile cafe that feeds the homeless. Here, oh, that's awesome! All the donations, and I'm I'm naming it the "You Have the Right to Remain Silent" movie series. <laughs> well, sure you to are. Tie in my law practice, <laughs> but you can see how this book it does reference the fact that it's now my law office. But this was the front of it exactly a hundred years ago in 1920. Amazing. So that, that's, that's amazing. Sort of the, Rudolph Valentino. Rudolph the that so that's going to be the first movie we show. But, oh, I love it. The, it's, I it's love so that. Just right outside <laughs> where we're parked. So that, that's how oh. that was. Now, I, I put up a lot of old documents in parchment. And you can see that fluorescent light is not good to parchment. Mm -hmm. over a period of time. But, however, uh, you know, I've, I've got some important legal documents, and they look good, so that's what really counts. Sure. Anyway. <laughs> sure. This is beautiful. So, you come around, I, I, I have just over, if you do this 40 years, if you do it long enough, you're just going to collect different things as you go. Mm -hmm. And so, I've just collected different things like, a print uh, commissioned by Governor Sanford. He was the governor wow. before I was here, but he later ran for Senate and uh, helped his campaign and, and yes. got that. Yes. Got that Sanford. Yes. This is the old courthouse uh, here in Alexander County mm -hmm. that burned down in 1967. And I remember as a I'll small be. kid, I was 13 years old, waking up and seeing the middle of the town on fire. Oh. This burned down in 1967. The new courthouse that we have, we say new, but it was built in 1970. And one thing I'm, I'm doing right now, we have a muralist in town who's already done several things and, uh, of local uh, interest. I'm going to have him do this uh, on the back of my law office here, a mural of the old courthouse. And I'm going to have him superimpose on this. You can see a seat, but I'm going to move it up 
two of our most famous attorneys who practiced during that period of the courthouse, uh, Hayden Burke was one, mm -hmm. who I told you a story who died in the, uh, at the end of a trial on his 95th birthday, which he won. The court ruled in his favor after he had died. And it was on his 95th birthday. So God he bless was still, him. He was still practicing law uh, on his 95th. The other wow. was Romulus Z. Lenny, who at the turn of the of the last century, 100 years ago, uh, was a congressman from here and just a prolific attorney. He tried 50 capital or death penalty cases, half for the defense and half for the prosecution. So you can tell he... So I'm going to have those two on a bench out front talking to each other. Oh, so sort what of a to gift to the together. What a gift to the town. So, well, I, I just think things like that need to be commemorated and remembered. But Amen. That's, that's what we're doing. So as Amen. we come on back, this is not a large office. And, and of course, you, you tie everything together. Of course, you couldn't have law and order without Barney Fox. <laughs> North Carolina is a yeah, must, North isn't Carolina, it? North Carolina, I mean, that's just a symbol of <laughs> stopping crime in due time. Yes. Uh, so you have a, a, him. This is where I first started practicing. We had done reception, and I started in 1979 in an old house that's where the post office now is. And you can see it's a large Annie Bellum house mm -hmm. that I actually lived in and practiced. I rented that entire house for $250. No kidding. <laughs> Lived in it, practiced wow. in it. And you can see this is an article that came out uh, in October of 1979. A little different. Oh, I Thicker don't know. Hair, blacker I, hair. I don't know. Dark mustache. <laughs> that was the September 27th, 1979 edition of the time. So, Goodness. Uh, oh. Absolutely the epitome of a small town lawyer. Well, I don't John. know epitome, but but uh, I've enjoyed it. Now here I have two things that I literally hang on the wall that I use in every criminal case in front of a jury. Uh, the definition of reasonable doubt, mm -hmm. which I think is crucial, uh, particularly in a criminal defense. And then the burden of proof to show that in guilty cases, of course, it has to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Anything less than that, such as possibly guilty or guilt likely or possibly not require not guilty verdict. So it's a graphic way of letting the jury uh, yes. pigeonhole how they feel about a case to ensure that the law's followed. And only when it's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt is the only way they can come back to be guilty. So I, I, I literally hang it on the walls. You mm -hmm. can see where I've Taken it to court and it's got it's little gotten some good in. use on it. Right. And uh, somebody gave me this years ago, be good for goodness sake. And Aww. I think that's good advice. Yes, sir. To to anybody, regardless of the circumstances. Yes, sir. This is a flag that my uncle Carl Chapman, who died in World War One, oh. was given to him at his funeral and later on the family gave it to me, so of course I have that prominently well, displayed. Absolutely. In, Thank in, you. in the office. Carl Chapman. Right. Who, who was from here. From Taylor's here. As well. Oh, goodness. So, uh, come on in. This is my office. Uh, you can see I just put up stuff as, as things. I made it sort of a museum. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, and over 40 years, like I say, you collect things, and, and each one has a story to it or, or something I'm involved with. I'm a big Clarence Darrow fan. Yes. You can see I even got, <laughs> I, I, I bought his autograph years ago. So that's his actual oh, autograph wow. on parchment. But you have him here. Uh, wow. Fantastic. So you have his quotes here. And this is the, the uh, famous monkey trial in mm -hmm. Tennessee that he took part in and uh, that was done a picture of it. and if you'll see look closely the artist put monkeys in different locations oh in the, in the oh. picture to, to, to bring it so that was a famous unbelievable monkey trial yes 
So, of course, underneath him, because I'm far underneath him as an attorney, there are some things that, that I did. We talked about the becoming Atticus Finch yes, seminar and things of that nature. And, and so I am, I am under him and much further under him than what <laughs> the uh, couple of inches. <laughs> I love it. This is my conference room. As I mentioned before, this, at one time, this whole building was <laughs> Tattersville Town Hall, which had the police department in it. And it was also the fire station. This is in the 30s, 40s, 50s. This was their drunk tank. It <laughs> opened up on the street. And I remember, uh, and having grown up here, I remember this being the drunk tank, or uh, formerly the drunk tank here in the uh, in the uh, town. Mm -hmm. My uncle, Stokes Campbell, had a saloon across the street, the Old Town Tavern. So the police chief would literally sit outside, put his chair back, and we saw somebody come out of my uncle's saloon stumbling on the wooden plank sidewalks. He would simply go get them, walk them around, put them in here, no record no record whatsoever. They, they they were just going to sober them up. It was just like Andy Griffith, Otis Campbell. Yeah. And they put them in to this drunk tank, which they called the calaboose, which is a French word for fancy jail, which somebody had a great <laughs> sense of humor. The bars were, when I renovated, were right there in that upper wall. So okay. that was the only... Uh, opening to the outside. This was a firewall that I opened up when I renovated it. Found, I, I did not mean for the conference room to be higher, higher elevation. Mm -hmm. That's just the lay of the land. Yeah. So that's the drunk tank. So my conference room is the former drunk tank for the town of Tattersville, which is quite appropriate maybe for some of the conferences that I've, that I've had in there. <laughs> But I've enjoyed that. So, again, I put a lot of these things that you see are, oh. are, are, you'll see some evidence tags and so forth. They are, there are evidence presented in certain cases that they've let me keep that have some significance to me and ah. have a story behind it that, that, uh, that I can recall and so forth. So, yeah, fantastic. But we, uh, I do personal injury, which of course uses a spine, and I tell somebody that comes in handy, if somebody says I'm spineless, I can say, no, I've got one at my office. It's right there in the drunk tank. So, and I use the flip charts a lot, so I have everything ready that I can walk in the court, and my routine is pretty similar. If, you, if you've heard me try one criminal case, you will have heard me try every one, because as I tell the jury, Thank God the law doesn't change from case to case. It applies to everybody, rich, poor, black, white, young, old. It doesn't matter. And so, you know, you'll be bored if you go to two of my trials because you've heard it the first time in the first trial. So it doesn't change. <laughs> well, it stands true over time. It does. I mean, and that's. I think that's also being genuine with the jury as to the reality of the situation. Jurors are not fools. They are not fools. That's right. So if you, there's an old saying that uh, the secret to success is sincerity. Once you can fake that, you got it not. But I don't find that to be true. I think it's just that you've got to be pretty genuine. And as I told you before, the, the best advice that I ever got from a trial lawyer was soon when I got out, trial lawyer, old trial lawyer, pulled me over the side and said, son, let me give you a little bit of advice. He said, you've spent three years learning to think like a lawyer. Spend the rest of your career learning to think like a person again and forgetting what thinking like a lawyer is. And because your jurors are made up of people. Yeah. And having grown up here, you know, I, I, I know the good people that we have here and I think they're all over the state. We may disagree on a lot of things, but deep down they're good people. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I can say as a, an attorney as well, that my friend Joel, Joel, every time I see you, you do genuinely look like you're having a good time. I do. I, I mean, uh, I don't know if I've worked a day in my life. If you're doing what you feel like you're called to do, uh, or meant to do that you enjoy, I, that's not uh. really working. Blessed. Uh, my father was a minister 
totally different from me. He worked until the week he died. He enjoyed it. Well, My son's a writer. He enjoys it. So, and you said you were 13, and you woke up and could see the center of downtown and, and the courthouse on fire. Right, so you have right. been here a, a number of years. Well, I was actually born in Hickory. Came over to Alexander County when I was three because my father took a church here in the county. So I've been here ever since, except the seven years I spent in Chapel Hill, my second home. But uh, came back here, saw no reason not to. Uh, mm -hmm. My friends and family were here. Uh, this is where I wanted to be. I've never had a regret Great. being here, you know, at all. What's uh, Tell us just a little bit about Taylorsville and Alexander County. Taylorsville is a very interesting place. It, it has uh, it has very good people. And again, there are a lot of disagreements mm -hmm. that we may have politically and things of that nature. But deep down, I've found them to be very good people who will do anything for you. You could not be so fortunate if you're house uh, burns down or you run a problem then to be in Alexander County because you will be flooded with people wanting to help. Great. And it's the old, we're rebuilding the barn uh, back mm. in, the, in the West in colonial times mm -hmm. where everybody came together and did. That's pretty much the case here in this county. So if something, if you have a problem and you're, you're wanting some help, the people here will flood you with help. Can't say more about a place than that. No, that's, that's, that's why I've been here all my life. So. A lot of um, farmland around here driving over. A lot of agriculture in the area, I, I say, or what's the... Uh, well, when I drive in, I live on Lake Hickory, and when I drive in, I see more cows than people on the <laughs> way in. And I think that's pretty good. It's <laughs> never a traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have plenty of time. It takes me about 25 minutes to get here. And like I said, I see more cows than people. But <laughs> how do you beat that? You mm -hmm. have the, the, the beauty of this county and you having 25 minutes to meditate, pray, whatever you do Amen. during that time. Uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's also a pleasure well. doing that. But yeah, ag agriculture is very large. We are the... Uh, uh, I was a county commissioner. I was fortunate that the people, I fooled them at least once to elect me the county commissioner. <laughs> but uh, I remember the time, at that particular period of time, we were the second poultry uh, uh, producer in the state of North Carolina. So you have a lot of, a lot of that, but all, of course we're known for apples. and the, mm -hmm. Actually, Taylorsville is known as the Apple City. Okay. Yeah, so okay. We have a lot of things around that. We have the Apple Festival. Uh, in October of each year, so good. That's a that's a large piece. Good deal. It's so. it's a it's a beautiful town driving in. It really is. It's, 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 it's an it's, old school. Oh, it is hometown it's, looking North Carolina. It is, and and, and coming back here, uh, I just threw up a shingle and said I'm an attorney, and I figured at the time if people came in, I made money. If they didn't have a lot of leisure time, and at 25 <laughs> and single, I, I could go either way with that. <laughs> and it's, and it, my life has generally been a balance between the two living in an area like this. So the quality of life Great. is just, you can't beat it. As far as the, the makeup of folks here, how, how are the politics? Well, I, I've always described this county as being 90% white, 85% Baptist, and politically in the, in the last couple of years, about 80% Trump supporters. So mm -hmm. you, you, it, it is typically Southern in that respect, mm -hmm. that I may not agree with with a lot of the politics of the local people, but I know deep down they have great concern for people and, and they they have no problem standing up for what they believe in, which there's there's a lot to be said for that. Well, you gotta respect that and know where a person stands. That's I respect fine. that more than somebody who won't take a stand either way, so. Well said, so. well said. And uh, it's just like the old joke. Well, what do you think will ruin the world first, or is the is the worst thing ignorance or apathy? And mm -hmm. you say, well, I don't know. And furthermore, I don't care. So it's, mm -hmm. I can forgive ignorance more than I can forgive apathy 
of people. Sure. Apathy is a choice. Sure. Ignorance is more of a chance that you have. I think that is very, very well said. And of course, here in North Carolina, we've got 12 jurors and one or two alternates, That's generally. Uh, how are they chosen and selected in North Carolina? Well, typically, uh, you start a case, the state, having brought the charges, as we're set up in our constitutional system, rightly has the burden of proof to prove the case. And, and, and I go into the history of this country uh, with jurors. We, we came into existence because of King George. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he could throw anybody with merely an accusation in the prison or into the Tower of London. So when we, we left them, we said, we're not going to have a system like that. And if we're the first system of government in the history of mankind where the government didn't tell the people what they could and couldn't do, we, the people, told the government what uh, limitations they had. And, and one limitation is in criminal cases, if, if the government is going to bring charges, then they have the burden of proof. Mm -hmm. And by having the burden of proof, they go f first. And that burden of proof is not merely uh, more likely than not that the person did it, but you have to be fully satisfied, you have to be entirely convinced. And it's based on the premise that our founding fathers had that it's better to uh, let a hundred guilty men go free than to send one innocent man to jail. And so with that in mind, I, I, the, the, a jury is chosen where both sides are able to ask questions to see if there's any reason why they can't be fair and impartial. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where in cases like I've, I've represented people of color, then I'm going to be very forthright with the jury because I know the people here are generally honest and forthright. Mm -hmm. They may have some prejudices, mm -hmm. but I found that that they're open about it, right? And that's all I can ask for yep. is that they're open about it. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the same time, mm -hmm. I also know the people to be, as I mentioned before, about uh, if you have a problem, they will will help you out one on one. Yes. And so it's one on one in in a, in a jury saying there is a defendant sitting next to me, mm -hmm. and they have to look at this person. Presuming, of course, in our system that that they are innocent till proven guilty. Right. So we have we get to ask the questions and pick a jury along those lines. Both sides get some peremptory challenges where they get to pick a certain number. Mm -hmm. Generally six in North Carolina, uh, both sides, where for any reason you can. There's a lot of people who are excused for calls because for right. some reason they say they can't be fair and impartial, mm -hmm. and, and the judge will make that decision in that. But Ultimately, you come together with the jury. Uh, hopefully, that's representative of the people of the county okay. and, and of the defendant. Do you find, generally, and you've tried a tremendous amount of cases here in Alexander County, do you find, or how do you establish that rapport? You talk to them, it sounds like you really do. Just, sit, just go over well, the history and you get to know these folks. I, again, I think it's more of what the the old lawyer told me to think more like mm -hmm. a person than a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so I, I try to prepare a case that how can I explain this case in two minutes mm -hmm. to my neighbor sitting down at my uh, in my living room over a glass of tea. If you can't summarize your case in that short period of time mm -hmm. where they understand it, then you need to go back and put it together that way. And it needs to be in logical common sense, or it's really not valid anyway. Okay. Uh, and so I, I, I do the same thing with the jury. It's not, again, I, I see attorneys acting like attorneys. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll see some attorneys who have an attorney voice and presentation. And then when you see them at lunch, mm -hmm. it's totally different. They uh. have a great personality and so forth. And <laughs> they're very down to earth. And I think we, we are trained in law school to be lawyers. Mm -hmm. And we have to get out and remember that we're really people. I have the advantage here of having grown up here. Okay. And 
<clears throat> and by growing up in a small town in the South in the 60s, uh, it, you, you met everybody. I, for instance, yes. I, our schools were not integrated until my sixth grade. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1954, the year that the Supreme Court said in Brown versus Board of Education that separate was not equal, and so therefore all schools should be integrated. Mm -hmm. Well, it took the South a long time to accept that, and it didn't accept it in the South, and particularly here, until 1966 when I was in the sixth grade. So until that time, I never had a, a, a black mm -hmm. friend, okay, childhood friend, mm -hmm. because... It, you meet your friends at either at church or at school when you're growing up. Right. And that's just, right. they were segregated. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a, I won't say a cultural shock, but it was, it was eye opening that it, at that time that when we finally became integrated and people worried there would be problems and so forth, I was really impressed that at least here, everybody accepted everybody. And um, I think that stays with people, again, when they're dealing individually. People in large groups bring out probably the worst in people. Interesting. People who are one-on-one -on -one with somebody mm -hmm. generally brings out their best. And, and like I said, I found people here, if I don't care how anti-immigrant or anything of that nature politically some people could be. I know everybody in this county, if, if an immigrant would come to their door and say, I'm hungry, mm -hmm. they would feed them. If they Wonderful. needed a shirt, they would literally take the shirt off their back to give to them. So I think the success that I've had, particularly in this county, representing people of color, is mm -hmm. that in that courtroom, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. Okay. It's that person at their door, and they're dealing with that person. Mm -hmm. And so they see that person where if they go maybe to a political rally, they may act and believe differently. <laughs> but when they're in the room, looking at that person straight in the eyes and dealing with that person, they're going to treat them as equals. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can ask for in a case like this. That's right. Uh, because some of the sexual assaults that, that I guess I've done, uh, defending people of color who I felt were wrongfully accused, and the jury agreed with me mm -hmm. that they were, were wrongfully accused. That's the core of it, is, is that any prejudice... Uh, anything of that nature uh, was completely thrown to the side and they dealt with everybody as people. And that's all you can ask for in any trial, particularly in a criminal case, that you just see objectively it's not filtered through prejudice mm -hmm. or something of that nature. Whether they're guilty or not, Sure. let the truth and objective facts be the determining factor. Don't let it be influenced or shaded by by race or creed or color or anything of that nature. And I've found that particularly the people of Alexander County are able to do that and have done that time and time again in cases I've had. Uh, sexual assault is probably one of the worst things that can happen to a person. It's, it's sex sure. and it's violence. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess the only thing worse is actually murdering mm -hmm. somebody. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of cases where I'm appointed, particularly, to mm -hmm. people who are charged with sexual assault, right. who are absolutely guilty. They've either, either admitted it, there is objective evidence, there is corroboration, there are consistent statements by the victim that... They are factually and legally guilty of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And they have, and it has resulted not in trials with me, but in pleas. It's very difficult, and, and, and it's impossible really for me to try a person and defend them without it resulting in a plea mm -hmm. if they're in fact 
they've convinced me, first of all, that they're not guilty of it. Mm-hmm. And of course, in looking at a case, I will look at, uh, did they make any admissions? Did they have any con- confessions? I'll look at, is there objective evidence? Was there a medical exam done that reveals certain things that indicate uh, sexual assault? And those are all certainly relevant things that come into play. It, it, any other scientific evidence, any corroboration, any eyewitnesses, anything that that a past history that mm-hmm. indicates that person's like that. All those are legitimate factors considered, but generally it comes down to the word of one person against another. And and, and to kill a mockingbird, that's essentially what it was. Mm-hmm. You had Tom Robinson, the the the, the poor black guy who was uh, uh, come on to by Miss Mayella mm-hmm. and when something went wrong she did not want the embarrassment of that that she had done that so she accused him of sexual assault and of course in the fictional town of Macon, Alabama 1935 the prejudice was just too much right. to do that uh here, the first thing that I try to do is to strip the prejudice off the case. And that has a lot to do with the jury selection. Uh, you have to, I feel as a criminal defense attorney, make the jury convinced that you share values with them. Because when I'm handing a case after the jury uh, to the state who has the first opportunity to ask questions or choose the 12 they want it and then mm-hmm. it's up to me and they've heard the state accuse this person of all these things when I get the case that jury is ready to kill me and the defendant the only question is which one are they going to kill first <laughs> and so I have to turn that around mm-hmm. by establishing the fact that there are, there are certain shared values, and those shared values are that a person is innocent until mm-hmm. proven guilty, that the burden is on the, on the government, uh, uh, that they have to prove that, and they have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt to the full satisfaction uh, of the jury. Those are values that our forefathers have, that's shared values that we should all have. Mm-hmm. And if you can eliminate the prejudice, then you, you at least are able to bring it to maybe a, a, an even field uh, for the jury to see. Then I think when you have particularly a one-on-one, he said, she said type situation, mm-hmm. the, the, the shared value that I try to impress is that truth is consistent. Mm. And I draw upon the fact that having brought up in a very religious county as the son of a minister, Mm -hmm. that many of us accept the fact of the Bible saying Jesus is, Jesus being the ultimate truth, is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so the truth is also consistent. And I, I don't know about a lot of people, but my mother, if I did something wrong, would pull me to the side and get my story on it. Okay. She wouldn't have any other evidence, but she'd get my story on it. And then being wise, she would wait about three days, <laughs> ask me to give the story again. Uh-huh. And if, if I were lying, <laughs> it wouldn't be consistent. Ah. And she knew that. And so she would deal with me appropriately. <laughs> so the truth is consistent. So when I'm trying these cases, trying to determine where the truth is, what I'm looking when there's no admissions, when there are by the defendant where, or confessions, there's no scientific evidence, there's no corroborative evidence, there's no eyewitnesses, there's no videos, there's no audios, there's no prior background of having this type of, of uh, propensity to, to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the consistency of statements made by the uh, accuser because if you accept the shared value that truth is consistent that it will be consistent uh, from time to time Mm -hmm. and 
in those types of cases, unlike in the days of To Kill a Mockingbird in 1935, we have the benefit now as criminal defense lawyers of having discovery of every statement that has been made by the alleged victim. So we're, or I'm poring over that to see if there are inconsistencies. They may have talked to a social worker, they may have talked to a friend, a co-worker, a uh, detective, mm -hmm. a, in some cases, uh, if it's a teenager or something, a child advocacy person. Mm -hmm. It may be to a doctor conducting a medical examination as to what happened. So you have different, different uh, statements. If those statements are consistent, reflecting the truth, that's very valuable for the state in, in their presentation of the case. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, I've found there are inconsistencies. And a lot of people say, well, they're inconsistent about some minor things, but in the ultimate thing, whether he or she sexually assaulted them, they always come back to it being true. Well, I, again, that brings me back maybe to my religious background and, mm -hmm. and my father listening to him give sermons. And I recall Luke 16, 10, where Jesus said, he who is honest in small things is honest in large things, but he who is dishonest in small things is dishonest in large things. And so with that in mind, uh, I will present the case that way because to me, that indicates, I'm comfortable with that mm -hmm. because that indicates that the truth is not being spoken. Most allegations of sexual assault, I believe, are true. I believe they can be proven. I believe they were generally admitted most people I represent who end up entering a plea for sexual assault do so because they've admitted it. Mm -hmm. They've admitted it. It's hard to argue with that. Mm -hmm. It's true. true. They did it. It's true. Everybody can accept that fact. And everybody can accept the fact they're going to get substantial punishment for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But imagine if you're wrongfully accused and it's just somebody's word saying that. That's very, that's just below the actual act of sexual assault being so bad mm -hmm. that you're falsely accused of it. Now, in every case that I've won, and I make it, I, I make it imperative because I think, again, the jury wants this. I have the right not to put on any evidence. The defendant has the constitutional right under the Fifth Amendment not to testify and the court will instruct the jury that the failure of the defendant to testify should not be used as evidence against him which is a shared value mm -hmm. our founding fathers when we broke off with england said we're going to have it this way and it's good and it's been great for our for our country mm -hmm. but in every case i i have the defendant take the stand because I think the jury wants to hear the defendant say they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that, and, and usually when I'm trying to decide myself and talking with my client whether they're guilty or not, when I tell them I plan to put them on the stand, the slightest hesitation indicates that there's a problem there for me. Okay. And the ones that I found who, who, I believe are not guilty will say, I want to do that. Okay. And so when I put them on the stand, the first thing they do after they give their name is have them to look directly at the jury mm -hmm. in the eyes and ask them a broad question, not just the specific allegations of this case, but have you ever sexually assaulted this person, regardless of its charges in this case, have you ever done that? And if they can look at the jury and look at them in the eyes, again, you have that one-on-one, -on -one, any prejudice that was still remaining in that drawer, mm -hmm. 
probably goes out the window at that time when that person does that. And so I'll go, and it's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove I didn't do something other than saying I did not do it. Mm -hmm. okay. So whatever direct examination I may have with them, I will end by having them look one more time just to make sure that jury knows he just wasn't able to pull it off one time. He's got to look at me and look at me in the eyes and tell me again he didn't do it before I and going to give him the benefit of the doubt that this shared value that we have in this country uh, allows me to give him. And so, to me, that says a lot to me when somebody will look you in the eyes when there's no other evidence. Now, some people can look you in the eye, and despite all the evidence that <laughs> will we'll deny something, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. people that do sure. that. Sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, that's why those objective things override somebody, because people will mm -hmm. lie. Mm -hmm. Defendants will lie. Accusers mm -hmm. will lie. Mm -hmm. But somebody who's charged that has no particular evidence other than the accusation of somebody who has inconsistent statements, who has made inconsistent statements, and the truth is consistent, because our mamas taught us that, and the Bible teaches us that, then to add the fact that they're looking them into the eyes and saying that is pretty powerful, as mm -hmm. it should be. Yes, sir. And so when I'm arguing then with the jury, I will during the course of the trial, and you'll see flip charts in my office. And a lot of attorneys these days will use PowerPoints and things. And, and uh, I tell people there are two reasons I don't use PowerPoint. One is I think they're too canned looking. It's too too professional, not quite genuine enough, and two, I don't know how to do PowerPoints. <laughs> Those are the two reasons. So I use flip charts. So as, as I'm going through the trial, because I found in the past a lot of jurors say, well, I don't really remember what they said in, in, in that testimony, so I really, they'll do that a lot. Mm -hmm. They'll want to hear, will the court reporter please read back certain things? Well. If I, when I'm cross, when I'm examining, and I don't like to say cross-examining the alleged victim because I'm really not cross-examining that person. I, I think that you have to be respectful of all witnesses, and they have a testimony. I'm just pointing out where there could be inconsistency. So, having prepared the case and examined and have it in my own mind or literally on paper as to what inconsistencies I've found so far. That can change when they come to trial because you don't know which thing they're going to say. They've said different things. Uh -huh. I don't know which thing they're going to say now. So I will ask them, you know, as they testify, I'll see what they say. And so I will write it down on a flip chart. And I will, uh, particularly if the accuser is a teenager, mm -hmm. Uh, I want them to not feel that they're intimidated. And I'm not about to do that. Or the jury's going to come across the, their bar and kill me. Ah. But I, I think it's also getting to the truth. That the truth is, is called uh, calculating, uh, 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 finding it is something that is cold and calculating. So you can... You don't have to be a Perry, have a Perry Mason moment. So I will, as they give that testimony, I will write it down in their exact words that they say it. And so I'll back, then back off from the flip chart and say, now let me read this to you. Is this your testimony? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Do you look the jury in the eyes today and tell them that it's true? Yes. Okay. And then I won't go into, yeah, but didn't you say on this occasion you did this? No, what well, didn't you do that? Mm -hmm. But I'll go through the things that I know that are inconsistencies without cross-examining or without confronting them about it. So I'll, in a typical case where somebody is very inconsistent, therefore, in my opinion, untruthful, uh, I'll find seven or eight. And then when I get through going through those and writing them down, I'll once again ask them, is that true? And they'll say, yes, 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 yes. 
then in, when I'm presenting my case, I will put on the detective or the social worker or the doctor or the friend mm -hmm. or somebody who they told a totally inconsistent statement to. And I will write that underneath what they've said and who said it. Okay. Again, it's just for, for the jury, helping them to see the inconsistency that's not relying on a cross-examination to do that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people see attorneys as the king of cross-examination or the queen of cross-examination. Nah, you're just getting to the truth and you're getting inconsistencies coming from different people. So when I finish, I'll have the eight things that the uh, accuser has said, and then underneath it, maybe two or three inconsistencies where they've said, just with that one topic, a different thing to somebody else. So when I get through with the case, I will label that as an exhibit, mm -hmm. introduce it in evidence, because we started with a clean slate. We've got everything that I wrote down was came from the stand. I've had every witness to tell me, now, is that true, what I've written? And sometimes I've written things, and they said, well, that's not... That is what you're writing there is not what I said, and I will just rip it off uh, and start all over because I I want that jury to know that we are only interested in what comes down from that stand. Yes. And so when I get through, I have exhibits that I can introduce in the evidence, and that during final argument, when I go over the definition of reasonable doubt, which is that you have to be fully satisfied or entirely convinced. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you can find somebody guilty. Anything less of that is not guilty. Mm -hmm. And then I put it in terms of the chart that I use in every case that I've got hanging on my walls. Mm -hmm. I just put them in the car or walk them down to the courthouse and show them to the umpteenth jury because, again, the law is the same as it's been for 250 years, mm -hmm. as it should be, as it applies to everybody. I will present my final argument that way, and I will remind them of Luke 16.10, and, and, and there have been objections in the past to using the Bible, and there's some, some case law that says it's not good to, or not valid to, to uh, cite the Bible. But you tell my juries here in Alexander <laughs> County that. Uh, let the district attorney object to the Bible. But if the court rules that way, I think you simply say there was a great teacher 2,000 years ago who said this. Everybody knows who the great teacher 2,000 year, years ago was, at least in my sure. county. Sure. The people I know. Uh, know who that is. Mm -hmm. And I think if you essentially say, now, you know, this test of credibility and finding the truth is not my test. It's Jesus's test if you believe that. And if you don't, you can use some other uh, uh, method to determine how you come to the truth. But if you apply it that way, with the he who is dishonest in small things, and, and all these things that come out are small things, they're also dishonest in large things, mm. if that's the case. And that's what my mm. mama found out when I tried to tell <laughs> I love her the, 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 you know, something that wasn't true. So hopefully at the end of the case, they will apply the law. That's their job mm -hmm. to apply the law. To the facts of the case, since it's an exhibit, they can take that exhibit back to the jury room if there's any question about it. And I think mm -hmm. that's the beauty of it mm -hmm. because generally arguments are not something are aren't in an exhibit and can't be taken back to the jury with the jury. But here you've got an exhibit of evidence, and they they accept that because we all created it together. Ah, it's our baby. Mm -hmm. And people generally don't kill things that they created. I see. They help create or saw created. They accept that. And so I've had some who will take that back to the jury. And I want them to take that back to the jury, you know, uh, because that helps. So 
I've been fortunate in that the, and I've had like a dozen in my career cases of people of color in this county who I felt were wrongfully accused of sexual assault that did not end up in convictions because the, the good people in my county, when they looked at these people in the eyes and they looked at the principles that our government was found on, found that it applied to everybody equally, including my client, and gave them the benefit of the doubt and found them not guilty. Probably the, the, the best thing that, that has ever happened in a case that I really felt strongly about was after they found the defendant not guilty, the judge went to see the jury. And these are 12 white Baptist Trump supporting jurors who just found an illegal immigrant Hispanic not guilty mm -hmm. of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And they said to the judge, is the defendant still here? And she said, no, they've taken him back for processing. And they said, we just wanted to apologize to him for even being charged. Wow. And wow. so at that point you feel good wow. that the person that you've screened, mm -hmm. to, that you felt was not guilty, he was willing to take the stand and look him in the eyes and say, I'm not guilty, I did not do this. Wow then you know that, that the system of justice works and it works without prejudice, unlike 1935, make them Alabama and to kill a mockingbird when the prejudice was just too great mm -hmm. to uh, overcome with these other shared yes. values to find him not guilty. So whether we think we've come a long way and yes, there's racism, Yes, there's prejudice. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that when people see another person, regardless of who that person is, in the eyes, up front, one-on-one, -on -one, their goodness comes out. Great. Just as it does with if they were needing to be fed, or they needed the shirt off your back, or their mm -hmm. house burned down, and they wanted it, some help in, in getting it built back. Yes. Those people, regardless of the political differences or political environment, would help them. And that to me, that's been the greatest confirmation or affirmation for me coming back to my hometown that can be labeled in many ways that would you would not think would end up in a person of color being found not guilty, but uh -huh. has every time. That says a lot. It says a lot uh -huh. about the people, I think, here. So that's that's why I've never had any regret. Well, not mm -hmm. here, certainly, mm -hmm. but you know, I have the choice of coming back here. Yeah. They say half a life life is chance half is choice and so i had the chance to be to grow up here mm -hmm. but i had the choice to come back amen and i came back because of the what i saw the people of this county to be and i think that's true of most people in most counties mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if if you if you can just make people look at another person in the eyes and see their problems. Uh, I, I think every racist, prejudiced thing goes out the window. Mm. But we people in large groups mm -hmm. stirred up mm. by emotion and see people as some monolithic group that uh -huh. we don't like. Mm -hmm can't relate to that sure and i think that's where we have a lot of problems in society is just putting people and that that's true of people uh, uh, on the left and people to the right and i'm more liberal than i am conservative mm -hmm. and, and everybody around here knows that uh -huh. 
But I think that's true on both sides. We tend to see the other side as some monolithic group that, that is an ogre. And uh, when we actually get down and see each other at uh, the burger basket eating lunch, right. we actually see and like each other and right. with each other as human beings. Human connections. And, and with yeah. all of our technology, maybe that's a dying thing. But it sounds it like you're... A, you're you're, you're hitting on something. I think we as a society really need to work on this. Just getting to know people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, really. And, I, and rather than being led one way or another to think of people in, in some way as a group, when we know that every, just like every case depends on its individual facts, every person deserves to be treated and examined in their individual capacity. Certainly you can go to any group in society of any race or creed or color or religion. You're going to find good people. If you deal with them one-on-one, -one, you're going to find bad people. Mm -hmm. I don't care what group they're in. Sure. And it's just coming to the truth and dealing with that person one-on-one -on -one and coming to the truth of what the situation is and being genuine in doing that, I think is the the continued hope of our country. Mm -hmm. And I think we get away from that some you know, as the political pendulum goes one way or another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That pendulum, like anything, stays in the middle. It always uh -huh. comes back to the middle. And that's a shared value, I think, that this country will always have. Amen. So. Amen. We're going to continue talking quite a bit, Joel, and this is an honor for me. You're, you're not just... You have done this and you're teaching people. You are teaching attorneys how, about your experiences. You're, you're actually... I, I am, and, and I, I give them the same advice I got, mm -hmm. and that's forget about being an attorney mm -hmm. and go back to being a person that, mm -hmm. if, you were, if you were ever a person. <laughs> Atticus Finch, the name Atticus Finch, just from your heart, what does that name stand for to you? You know, when I was trying these cases over the over the years, I never thought really of Atticus Finch or To Kill a Mockingbird. You would like to, the story would be better if I said, you know, and every time I went in the courtroom, I thought Atticus Finch would do this because he was seeking truth and he did his presence. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I read the book as a freshman. I think, I think subconsciously mm -hmm. that stayed with me to know that there are people who are wrongfully accused. Mm -hmm and how terrible that is, mm -hmm. and to do everything we can. And that There is racial prejudice, mm -hmm. and we should eliminate that at, at, at every opportunity, and particularly strip it away in a courtroom. And so uh, it's an inspiration, and maybe an inspiration in a way that I really didn't realize at the time until afterwards people... Uh, approached me about it said, hey, that's, you know, w w would you do a seminar about Atticus Finch because you've won some cases, people wrongfully accused of color, which, which is to kill a mockingbird. Mm -hmm. uh, now going back and rereading it uh, w from the perspective of having pretty much been there on several occasions, really opened it up more for me and made me appreciate more of not only how well written that book was and how timely that book was when it mm -hmm. came out around 1960 when I was in the first grade and six years later going to integration and how that influenced, you would hope, have an influence on society. But at the same time, gave you hope that, again, that people looked at people as just another human being on an equal basis mm -hmm. with yourself. Well said. Uh, 